Good morning. This is Pastor Bob Douglas, and we're here to give you a topic that is just red hot right now. This is a topic that is shaking the world, and we have to get a sense of how things are working. In order to get any way to make uh, or get our minds around what's happening, uh, the word for today is authority. Authority is our ability granted to us to be able to exercise some sort of leadership. Okay? And there are two primary categories of authority. And I want to get into that this morning as we go through this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three examples of what structural authority or positional authority means and divine authority and they're very different and sometimes they overlap sometimes they just butt heads sometimes they just work together in amazing ways but you can't understand what's happening today when you turn on the television and one person is saying I have ultimate authority, another one says you have no constitutional authority to do this, you can't make me or stop me from doing this, back and forth, and there's all kinds of discussions going on right now about where the authority starts, begins, and how it plays out. Now, I won't be able to take you all the way through all the possible applications here, the, the, the topic is just too big, but I've been praying about this and studying scripture about it. I'm going to give you three good examples of how we are in a situation today where we have to really seriously consider where the authority comes from. Okay, first of all, I want to start with scripture because the one example I want to give you is how structural or positional authority can sometimes conflict with God's final authority. All right? And it comes from Matthew, 21st uh, chapter. We're going to read verses 23 and following. Matthew 21, 23. Jesus entered the temple courts. Now, this is in the last week of his life. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. Now, uh, okay, you get the idea. These are the people who are in charge. These are the, the bosses, all right? Jesus entered the temple, of course, while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. And here's what they asked. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you <clears throat> this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you can answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Okay. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? Interesting question. John the Baptist was one of the contemporary prophets and you had to be careful because he he had a very controversial ministry they discussed it among themselves and they said if we say from heaven he will ask then why didn't you believe him but if we say of human origin we're afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet so they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. You see, authority is <laughs> sometimes granted because society needs some sort of order. They need some sort of a structure to keep things organized. Uh, 
maybe the best way to explain this would be, okay, uh, if you were going to go into an office or a factory and there wasn't a boss and the boss didn't have enough leadership to actually help get things organized and the job done efficiently and every person kind of did their own thing and just stood there and kind of worked at their own pace and if they got something done fine if not it wasn't a big deal okay but that would be a very inefficient way for society to be structured and so to get the job done someone is placed in the responsible position given authority to work as a manager to keep the rest of the people organized in such a way that the job gets done. All right, that structural authority, it may have extreme importance when it comes to the efficiency of the um, organization or the factory or the shop or the office. But it doesn't necessarily have divine implications. But there are times when God puts people in authority in unique ways that make a difference. Because not only is society organized in a structural way, but God organizes his kingdom with certain authority and a certain structure okay but it's a different structure than what we use as a positional responsibility the positional responsibilities are very temporary <laughs> very very temporary you can have a boss one day and a different boss the next day <laughs> the position is still the boss <coughs> excuse me but like for instance in the Me Too period right here through this time even the most highly placed position of responsibility and authority can be removed in a heartbeat because of inappropriate things that they've done and they've abused their authority and it and all of a sudden they're no longer the boss they're no longer the owner and they're out on the street okay or maybe even in jail so Positional authority is very temporary. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, fine. We'll find somebody else to fill that spot. On God's level of authority, um, something different happens. Okay, um, I'm going to give you three examples. And here's the first one. Moses was a perfect person he was perfectly situated to know the difference between structural authority and he eventually came to understand divine authority and the difference between the two. If you uh, recall, he grew up as a, an adopted son of the Pharaoh in Egypt. He was taken out of the water, Moses, brought out of the water is what his name means. He was raised as the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. He knew structural authority. This was the primary, the ultimate, ultimate kind of authority structurally. The Pharaoh could do anything. He could put together a 10,000 man army and go against an enemy. He could put the economy in free fall. He could send people into all kinds of different activities and labors. He had ultimate authority, structural authority, because he was the boss of all bosses. So he spent, roughly, 40 years of his life being taught exactly what a structural system could be. He was given responsibility and he had to report back to the Pharaoh. He was 
a member in that structural authority system. And then he killed an Egyptian. He was sent into the wilderness. He spent 40 years as a shepherd uh, out there tending sheep in the vast wasteland of the wilderness. Not exactly a lot of authority there. And certainly he'd given up all of his structural authority in Egypt. Then there was the day of the burning bush. <laughs> And things got a little complicated. <laughs> Let me explain it a little differently. When God said, I want you to go back and free my people, this created conflict within Moses. You can read it in the scripture for yourself. It's there. How am I going to go back into a nation, a country, a system, a society that I have no position at all. I am completely helpless. What are they going to do? Are the people going to believe that I've been called to do this? Is the Pharaoh going to believe? What? How am I going to do this? And God has uh, sort of a um, strange dilemma to try and convince a guy who's basically structurally integrated into a system that his system doesn't fit that structure. And here's the situation. When God gives authority, when God gives authority, he uses a different measuring stick, a measuring unit. Um, I'm going to change just a little bit and move a little farther for forward in the story. Moses was called up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and the, and the instructions from God about how to be the leader of the people of Israel. And God designed a formula for what divine authority looks like. Uh, to build a kingdom, to build a, a, a building, you need building blocks. You need people who have the ability to fit together to make something strong and durable. Um, today we use concrete blocks, structural materials that we have about the same size, but they fit together. You put mortar between them, and all of a sudden, you've got a good, strong house. I was in Hurricane Andrew in Miami, 1992. And because we lived in a concrete block house, I could take the winds, the hurricane winds, that destroyed many, many, many buildings, because the building blocks were strong, and they were matched, and they were fitted together very well. Okay. So what does a God-ordered authority look like? First of all, when God gave Moses the Ten Commands, it was, you've got to let me be God. I have to be your ultimate source of authority. It just doesn't have any other place that we can go to be able to have a God-described role in the kingdom of heaven. First of all, we have to let God be God. Now Moses did that, and he became a giant building block, a cornerstone in the building of the nation of Israel because he was a God-designed leader. He was a God-ordained leader. And he created a spot of leadership that would exactly fit the design that God had created. You have to love me with all your heart. You have to let me be God. So what does a God-ordained authority look like? 
when it bumps up against a structural authority that has been set up by society. When Moses went back into Egypt and confronted Pharaoh and said, uh, the people of Israel have to leave, go into the desert and worship, and was eventually going to be taken back into the promised land, Pharaoh looked at him and said, you're an idiot. I am the authority. And I will tell you what will happen and what won't happen. I will tell you when, where, and if there will be any permission given. I will tell you what will happen and won't happen. I have the structural authority. It's the only kind of authority he knew. He had to do that. And so, the two came together, head to head. Moses knew that God had said the I am authority had sent him to do this responsible job. But he had no structural authority. He had no board of directors. He had no one elect him to that position. He didn't go to the people of uh, the, the Hebrew people and say, all in favor, uh, raise your right hand and say, we elect you to be our leader to go to Pharaoh. There was nobody on his side. Moses was the called one. He knew what God had said. So, who wins in that headbutting contest? Well, if you know the story, you know, God sends ten separate plagues to Egypt. When the tenth plague comes and God destroys the firstborn of every family as an indication of his ultimate authority, Pharaoh finally relents and says, okay, go do what you got to do. Get out of here. And the people of Israel are given the freedom to leave until somebody reminds Pharaoh, you still have an army, right? You still have all these hundreds, maybe even thousands of chariots, right? You've got all these trained soldiers. Who's going to boss you around? You have the most powerful military force in the world. Use it. Structural authority. And so he goes after the Israelite people. At the end of the story, when the people have passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, and when the chariots of the most powerful army in the world have been destroyed, and Pharaoh goes back to sit on the throne in his palace, What does his structural authority look like? Not much. He's sitting there in a totally destroyed country. Economically trashed country. And he has been ruined structurally. The second example is a very simple one. It was very important to me. The story of Elijah and Ahab. Ahab was the structural authority. He was the king in uh, Israel. And he was a powerful king. He, uh, he called the shots. When he and Jezebel decided to kill the priests, prophets, faithful people, he just executed him, his own order. Boom, gone. He had a structural authority. Even though he was an evil person, he was still the king. And then God called Elijah and confronted Ahab. And he confronted him on a different level than what we might expect. Because uh, Elijah was first to say, uh, it's not going to rain for three years or until God says that he's finished his program. 
Now the structural authority gathered his army together and went after Elijah to try and put pressure on the prophet to change his story. And God protected Elijah, provided him food, ravens brought food and meat, and water by the stream, and he, you know, he had the story of Elijah. He finally is sent up to the widow's house, um, and the oil and the flour are renewed every day in the, uh, in the vessels, in a miraculous ongoing miracle, and finally God says, okay, it's time for the meeting on Mount Carmel where he sends fire and destroys the altar and regains his position as the authority in the nation of Israel. Okay, so Elijah still fits into the pattern that Moses described in that great meeting with God on Mount Sinai. What was his primary credential, his primary authority? He loved God with all of his heart, and there were going to be no compromises in any way. No compromises. God was going to be the source of his entire ministry. Who he was, what he did, was under God's instructions. When God said, go hide, he hid. When God said, go to the widow's house, he went to the widow's house. When God said, go to Mount Carmel, he went to Mount Carmel. When God sent the fire, it wasn't the power of Elijah. It wasn't even the power of his prayer. It was the power that God had prepared to use, and Elijah was the authority that had brought all of these pieces together so that it could have the effect it needed. And it was the same thing when uh, Elijah was called by God to anoint the kings in the area who were going to become the new leaders after Ahab was removed. His structural authority was removed. And how did it turn out? Well, even though he tried to fool everybody by putting on the somebody else's armor and putting himself in disguise, God allowed an arrow to find a weakness in the armor, pierced him, and his blood flowed out of the chariot across the ground, and the dog licked up the blood. Structurally, he was destroyed. Physically and structurally, Jezebel was destroyed. Everybody that had been in that structural position were destroyed. And Elijah continued to do what God called him to do until God took him home. Okay, now we come to the experience we started with. If there was any person who was God-filled, God-ordered, God-anointed, God-ordained, God-authorized to speak, it would have been his son, Jesus. Nobody else loved God by the first, second, third commandments like Jesus did. No, nobody did. Um, I was just studying here the last couple of weeks, Easter. There was never a Sabbath, a Passover Sabbath, more completely fulfilled than Jesus resting in the tomb on that seventh day. So creation, God created this, he created that, he did this, he did that, he, all amazing things. He created the birds of the air and the fish in the sea and the vegetables on the ground and the plants and the animals and finally man. And on the seventh day he rested became the Lord's day. Well, after Jesus had completed everything, he rested. Nobody completely filled God's requirement as completely and you know, faithfully as Jesus did. But it put him in direct 
conflict with the structural authorities. The structural authorities were the Jewish leaders and they were also the Roman leaders. Um, I recognize that Rome was a very highly organized structural governmental agency. It was a very regimented system. Um, if you were in the army, if you were one of the centurions in the army in charge of a whole group of soldiers, you knew exactly where you were in the structure. Uh, your brigade had a number, your commanding officer was put in charge of you, he knew exactly where his orders were coming from, he passed them down to you, you took your troops and organized them a way that you know would be able to be effective in the mission they've been given, and everybody under your command took your orders and reported back to you on how it actually turned out and their overall effectiveness. It was a very highly structured society. So when the Roman centurion has a, a sick servant and he realizes Jesus has the power to heal him, he comes to Jesus and he says, could you heal my servant? Jesus said, I'll go to your house. No, 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 don't go to my house because it's against the law for a rabbi, which Jesus was, a teacher, to go into a Gentile house, especially a Roman house, and do any, because he'd be unclean, he would, it was just a, it was a strategic nightmare, a practical nightmare. Just say the word, and he will be healed. Nobody had said that to Jesus before. Why? Because a structured military man who understood human organizational authority recognized that Jesus had a similar authority that no government had given him. Um, <laughs> we all look for who's given the good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, when I was going to college and going to seminary, they said, okay, now we're going to ordain you. So they asked me a whole lot of questions, made sure I was orthodox in my beliefs, and then they met around in a circle, and they thoughtfully, carefully, prayerfully asked, is this somebody we can ordain? We can give our structural authority to this person to go out and serve as a pastor. I now have ordination in two different groups. These groups have given me authority to serve. That's structural. That's not divine. Divine authority means have I made Jesus Christ the center of my life, my words, my attitudes, my behavior, my spirit. Now if I've come to that point, then God has ordained with his authority and the accomplishments that come, come because he has given his seal of approval. But no matter what structural authority you might give, I mean, let's be honest, the church hasn't been that great when it came to figuring out which guy was going to be effective and which guy was going to collapse. We just don't have that divine knowledge. Even within the spirit of what we do is in good intention, we don't have perfect divine knowledge. And so we come to the point where we say, Sorry, I'm watching a hummingbird. Hi, George. A little green hummingbird is flying over my head. <laughs> Slight distraction. Okay. Even with our best intentions, our structural authority is not identical to God's authority. But every person has 
a specific role to play in being God's kingdom. And we fit into a God-designed place if we let Jesus Christ be the leader of our lives. And so we take our role. We have a little story in our family. Um, one of my boys was saying um, a number of years ago that we had a, an issue when he was arguing with his mother. She wanted him to do something and he didn't want to. Um, happens in every family, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I would step into the room and I had a little pattern that I followed. I said the correct answer that's required in this situation is the words, yes mother. And that's all you need to say. When there's a debate going on between mother and child, the correct answer is the words, yes, mother. And he described for us how that made him feel. And he hated that I made him say, yes, mother. That was submission to a parental authority. Coincidentally, I have heard him say on numerous occasions to his two sons, the correct answer in this situation is yes, mother. And he has taught the same lessons of submission to authority to his kids, even though he hated it as a child. We don't like to be submissive to authority. Here's the summary of this whole message. God has a place and a role for each person within his kingdom. He has a place, a role, a function that only can be described as a place like a building block, a structure that's put together in God's eternal kingdom to make it strong to make it solid. It would stand up to the test of anything that can happen in this world. But it can only be filled by someone who has a God-designed heart, a God-filled spirit, a God-centered perspective on what we're supposed to be doing. The structural requirements will come and go. And in a few months we'll have an election and then we'll see who puts that gets in that structural position we'll see bosses come and go um, we'll have people that are very important in our community that suddenly will have health problems and they'll no longer be able to fulfill that role surprisingly there'll be somebody else to take that structural position But it's only when God's in control of your heart that you can fill the job that He has designed for you. That authority to be His spokesman, to be His leader in the community, to be the one that people can depend on, the one who comes forward with truth every single time you speak. That comes from being God-designed. God ordained. Whether you've been structurally ordained or whether you've been given the stamp, the seal of approval, when we are faithful in obeying God's Spirit, amazing things happen because the Kingdom of Heaven is a very unique God-designed structure. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Every other stone in the building is designed on the same pattern as him. They all are identical. Now, think of Legos. Legos come in all kinds of different dimensions, but they're all able to fit precisely together. They're all designed so that they can interlock and they can 
make a, a, an interesting structure, a sculpture, and all kinds of different things because they fit together. God has engineered a family that's just like, very similar to, a Lego structure. Once they snap together, they become very, very strong, unified. And that's because God's authority has designed it. And He is the central driving force inside the heart and mind of every person that fits into that kingdom. Now you may not have any structure or responsibility. You may never have been elected to a position, never held a leadership role, never been made a Sunday school teacher or a board of elders or anything else like that. You may never have had a structure, but God has an authority for you. He's got a role, he's got a place, he's going to give you the chance to have effectiveness but you have to let him be the center thing in your heart and mind and life. And then you'll snap together with the rest of the members of the family of God and become a strong, dynamic, positive, creative, forceful kingdom. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this outdoor lesson. Thank you.